COVID to call the long haul. Here we go. So, so here, COVID 2019, a little bit of review this first slide. So COVID 2019 is a highly infectious pathogen. We all know this. We've all seen this before, seen all about it. It dominates the news all the time, right? So we know it transmits through the air, survives on smooth surfaces. It even goes through fecal oral transmission, which is something the Chinese discovered early on and has not gotten that much uh, attention in the West, but it can spread through fecal oral transmission similar to the way hepatitis spreads. So that means that the public restrooms have actually been a major um, vector of transmission because when you flush the public restroom, it aerosolizes some of the uh, water drops and things land up on the, on the floor. People walk through it. Then when they take their shoes off, it gets on their hands. And okay, so nonetheless, something to be aware of. It's very infectious. Uh, it can undergo a contagious silent incubation period. We all know it can be active in the person, but for a short period of time. And that is one of the problems is because you're infectious and walking around don't even realize it. Uh, it has three major presentations this is the active phase, right, which is we talked about in that first lecture that I referred you guys back to, which is one is more mild, right, throat soreness, body aches, fever, short of breath, right, and then the second stage or second presentation of it adds nausea, loss of appetite, and diarrhea, which can be life-threatening because it can dehydrate you. And then the third is the above symptoms with no cough, really, but pneumonia and a sticky occlusive mucus that winds up needing people to often be on a ventilator. So this is true, but at the same time, the Omicron variation includes nasal symptomology because of the variations in the spike protein. So that has changed from what COVID-2019 originally looked like. It's altered itself. And now there is a beta variation off of the Omicron, which is also called stealth COVID, which apparently produces, it's relatively new, only identified here in the past two weeks uh, in the United States. And uh, the data on it shows that it uh, is highly infectious, three times more infectious than Omicron, and Omicron being much more infectious than the original alpha version of COVID, and even more infectious than Delta. Uh, the Omicron variation called the stealth COVID, or nicknamed that, is because it produces no visible symptomology, but strongly attacks the neural system. And so people wind up not seeming to have any symptoms, and then suddenly not being able to walk correctly, not being able to move their hands. It looks like they're palsied. So this thing continues to mutate and change. So what we've got to present today is our best understanding right now of how to treat the sequela. And let's understand that, unfortunately, as it continues to change and mutate, we're all going to have to get smarter over time. Now, just to, again, reviewing and talking about COVID-2019 in general, it has several aspects and it resembles a warm disease in TCM theory, one being because it spreads through the air on surfaces and fecal oral, uh, and that mirrors the warm disease infection that was in 1643 from the great epidemic that gave rise to the warm disease school. It also creates fever, consumption of body fluids and diarrhea, and that's all warm disease uh, approach. It also resembles a cold damage pattern, a Shanghan pattern, because it suppresses cough function and fills the lungs with a thick frothy mucus. That's more like the Shanghan epidemic of 1800 years ago. But in that sense, it seems to be akin to what's called cold heat, which is a pathogenic dynamic somewhere between the two, described all the way back in the Huangdi Neijing and, and elsewhere. And again, if you go back to that first lecture, you can look on that and get a lot more detail on these different types of epidemic classifications from the classical period. But it also resembles a malaria disorder. Now, the reason I put the quotation marks around malaria disorder is because it's not malaria, as in the Western defined disease malaria, but malarial disorders, Nui Bing in Chinese, is a specific category of disease. And that's going to become important for us to understand. The sequela. It stirs the immune system. It creates a cytokine storm, if not well managed. It's kind of half there, half not. It kind of looks sometimes like the Xiaoyang presentation of the cold school, but it also looks like some aspects of the warm school, and malaria has its own categorization in TCM. Again, not the Western malaria, because the word for Nui Bing was applied to malaria, the true disease, much later, because the concept Nui Bing is in the Huangdi Neijing, Yellow Emperor's classic of internal medicine that dates back over 3,000 years. And that concept is there, but the Western defined disease of malaria only comes up much later in Chinese history. Well, 
last point here, similar to malaria, consumes the blood, allowing wind to arise, which is a TCM rubric. And it means it can result in neurological disease, stroke. But that last part is really important because as we are going to talk about sequela, sequela is, of COVID is very much related to the damage of the blood. All right, so the theory I'm gonna be putting forth is my understanding that's developed overseeing way too many people with this and reading too many case studies over a thousand people with this and seeing that this is damage to the blood. So if we wanted to put this in classical Chinese, we would call it, oh, shang shui lun, the theory of the damage to the blood, which is a theory I'm putting forth. And I'm going to share this with you and share the clinical results we get from it. Okay. Now, now further COVID-2019 resembles fire toxin leading to permanent disability. So 20% of the people who survive if they're on a ventilator have to be on permanent dialysis. Now that's pretty severe and that's the, you know, being on the ventilator. That's not your average person, hopefully. No, your average person would get on the ventilator. But 80% of who recover at all have some reduced lung capacity, apparently permanently, lung scarring. More than 40% actually never recover their sense of taste and smell. It's always imperfect. It could be better, but imperfect. 30% have some permanent liver scarring and loss of function. Now, that doesn't mean that their liver has failed, but it's impeded. What will this mean over time is a big question. Also, children who get COVID have manifested toxic shock syndrome, heart attack, Kawasaki's disease, and even now we're seeing learning disabilities post-COVID. So this is to say it's like a fire toxin. Because in TCM, we say fire scars, changes you like a scar touching a fire. So it changes your body more permanently. So this is one of the reasons why we need to manage it and manage the sequela very well. COVID resembles what we call lingering pathogen. So many people continue to test positive up to eight weeks after symptoms are gone. So because of that, now in the US, the CDC is saying, well, you don't necessarily need a negative COVID test to go back to work. Okay, well, we can discuss that separately as to if that's the best choice of what to do. But the ongoing positive test implies that there's a long lived viral presence, perhaps lying dormant, could even later in life resurge with new symptoms similar to the varicella virus, which produces chicken pox, and then years later comes back and produces shingles. So we don't know, and we will not know on COVID till years later exactly if it can do that, because people get chicken pox years later, shingles, 15, 20, 30 years later sometimes, get shingles because it can lie dormant in their body. We don't know if COVID does that, because COVID, we do know, COVID-19, can move through every tissue in the body. And from a virological perspective, following the virologists at Harvard University, they've discussed how no other known virus can do that. This is unique. It goes through every tissue. It doesn't mean it damages every tissue, but it goes through every tissue. So it has the potential to find your weak spot, to find the tissue that's already damaged from pre-existing pathology and then somehow nestle there. So this is why people who have obesity, which compromises a lot of the metabolism, who have diabetes, compromises the metabolism, who have heart disease and circulatory disease, again, compromising large parts of the metabolism. These people are much higher at risk for a bad COVID, or at the same time, it can be bad for them in terms of sequela that they wind up with. So we also have to be aware of what patient populations we have to manage more carefully. All right, so on we go. So. All right, so we're now we're picking up here with the convalescent phase, meaning after you've had the active infection, your active infection has faded, you're recovering, you're inevitably exhausted, right? So here, generally asymptomatic, and maybe this is 10, 14 days after the active infection. Certainly there are odd documented cases like the research out of South Africa that showed a case that was active for 186 days but that wasn't someone who had HIV, and so their immune system was severely compromised. How they survived 186 days is amazing, but there are outlier situations of long-term active infection. Also, although we have not identified one yet, there is a supposition in much of the research has been looking for it in terms of the research in the, uh, the American CDC has been looking for someone who's a carrier because we have some descriptions from the Chinese of children who seem to be carriers who were asymptomatic but were infectious for months 
Those seem to have resolved with treatment, but it's possible, like Typhoid Mary, the famous case of someone who could have an infection and be someone who spreads the infection, but at the same time does not show the symptoms. This is a possibility, but that's conjecture. However, we leave it out there for everyone to be thinking about. All right, but after you're asymptomatic, a lot of times you have restricted circulation, loss of endurance, physical weakness, okay? Um, okay, so this question that popped up in the chat, how long after the symptoms disappear can we work with this? Well, this is convalescent. So the convalescence here means you've just finished the active phase. This is roughly two weeks after you were diagnosed. You can start this. This is not the long haul. This is not the sequela. This is the convalescence after you were actively infected. If you're actively infected, you would have to go back to the other protocols that were suggested in the previous talk and in the article that I'll share with all of you. And you would have to look at those components of what to do. Actually, right now, since I believe that most of the people who have um, who are coming have uh, arrived, let me um, grab that article and I can put it up uh, into the chat so everybody can can have that and then glance at it if they'd like to while we're going along um, because it may be very helpful. Okay, um, so let me see. I'll grab that one second. Let's see, where is this finding? I'm sorry, this is taking me more time than I thought I would. I'll do this at the end when I stop working with the, um, uh, with the. I just sent the doc. They, they you, sent the you sent the published article? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, problem solved. All right, so on we go. All right, so here, the person afterwards will often have a, a, a pulse that's deficient, they've been run down, or soggy. Soggy has soft rolling edges, but less force. So in the gradations of pulse, it's beyond soft, but it's below slippery, soggy pulse. Or thready, very hard to feel, it's an extreme thin. Those are all possibilities, right? Not necessarily all occurring simultaneously. Can you have an outlier pulse? It's possible, but these are most common. The tongue is gonna to be slightly red, thin overall, thin body. The coat's gonna be dry, maybe a little yellow. They're gonna be run down. It's possible the tongue turns even a bit pale, okay? So, but if the circulation issue is predominant, in other words, they have aches, they have pains, they, they have trouble getting out of bed and it hurts, then you want to put them onto Yunnan Bayao, right, which is a very famous pill form medicine for traumatic injury um, and for damage to the blood. Yunnan Bayao has broad ranging effects in terms of cellular repair. It can be found in PubMed, which of course has all these Western medical articles about its uh, efficacy and healing. Additionally, you could give them straight Sanchi, Sanchi powder. Sanchi is, of course, noto ginseng, it's an herb. It's an herb that's used to alleviate blood stasis. Um, I'm a, I'm a bed, my phone. All right, I'm gonna have to do that. Annie, please mic. close the mic. Come up. All right, so, so where were we? Oh, so, um, San Chi, Noto Ginseng, is used to uh, alleviate blood stasis also, and is traditionally considered to be a longevity drug, longevity herb, because it helps your circulation to live longer. So this is when circulation issues predominate. So I can share a vignette of a patient who was a bit overweight, had the, uh, had COVID, got over it, and afterwards, now 14 days later, she said she had trouble getting out of bed. She goes, she would get out of bed and everything would hurt and everything would ache and every joint would hurt. She said she felt like she was arthritic everywhere. She was only in her mid thirties and she had trouble going to work though she was not only had she passed the active time period of having the active symptoms, she actually tested negative in a COVID test. So she was like, what's wrong with me? So prescription of Yunnan Bial, so from Yunnan Bial for 10 days, she was, the symptoms, the aches and pains were gone within two days, very quickly, but we scripted it for 10 days because usually we go a 10 day course. That's very traditional Chinese medicine. And the 10 day course is used because of what we call the 10 celestial stems. The idea of the cycles of heaven or 
of the diurnal cycle of the sun runs in a 10-day cycle. So that's very traditional herb prescribing is 10 days, 10 days. You'll see that in modern textbooks and classical textbooks, 10 days. Okay, so we ran 10 days with Yunnan Biao just to be certain because two days symptoms resolve, that doesn't mean they're gonna stay away, okay? So, all right, then if the fatigue issues are worse, exhausted, a little bit of kind of a, a, a weak about amount of, uh, a weak amount of, of mucus, a little bit of coughing, but a, <clears throat> like a weak cough where you're like, hmm, their lung chi seems weak, right? And more predominant with the efficient pulse and such. That's when you could prescribe wrench and baidusan. Now, wrench and baidusan, if you know your herbs, is ginseng is wrench and, and baidu means clear toxin, sun is powder. So the ginseng formula to clear toxin. This is used for a type of infection, wind cold usually, on top of an underlying deficiency. Now here's where it's interesting because we tend to typify COVID as a hot pathogen, but here we can use a formula that's for a cold pathogen because it also addresses the deficiency. Okay. Um, so the question, dosage. Well, the dosage, okay, in general, let's talk dosing for a second. Standard dose in all formulas is based on a person who is 140 pounds. So that would mean if you're, these are for the most part, most of the herbs I'll be suggesting are in pill form. The reason we predominate on the prescription of pill form is several fold. One, the person's sick. They don't want to boil herbs. It's kind of hard. They run down. Two, they need them fast. They need to act quickly because the, the presentation can change quickly. So the availability of the pills is faster and they can be stored and given out more quickly. Now, and also, at least the people in the United States, they're used to taking pills, maybe too much. Maybe we could talk about Western medicine being too much used, that's a question, but they're not as used to drinking the brackish black tea when you boil it up. Maybe that's a bad thing. Inevitably, liquid herbs are the best because liquid herbs have no binder. However, depending on the company and depending on the formulation, the issue is, is that a pill may be different by different companies. So most commonly, if you get what's called the wan form of pill, which is a little black pill, then those pills are usually eight pills three times a day for a person of 140 pounds, or as Jonathan put in the, in the chat above 63 kilos. If you're heavier, you must scale up. If you're lighter, you must scale down. Now, if you don't have that, if you're having a capsule form, then the capsule would need to be dosed appropriately because sometimes capsules are dosed three capsules three times a day because of the concentration, in which case that's for a 140 pound person or 163 kilos. Okay. So, um, all right. Now, someone put in the chat, are they safe for breastfeeding moms? And if not, are there substitutes? Well, the answer to, to both those is no. Um, these formulas are not, for someone who's breastfeeding, if you have, if you have to take this formula for 10 days, you got to make a substitute. This is, you know, you're sick, you're very sick, and you're probably exhausted, in which case you probably can't breastfeed. You can't breastfeed when you had the active COVID. And afterwards, for these 10 days, you probably should not when you're taking herbs. Now, is there anything in those herbs that are considered to go into mother's milk? No. So in that sense, you can say, yes, they're safe. However, generally speaking, if you're convalescing from a serious illness, you should not do anything that's metabolically challenging. And in that regard, breastfeeding is metabolically challenging. So for 10 days, maybe you get formula. Maybe the baby's got to go on formula for 10 days. It's not forever. And you're not going to take these herbs for forever. It's 10 days to two weeks. This is the convalescent phase. We're not talking about the long haul yet. We're talking about the convalescent phase. Okay. So this is, and additionally, you must continue the artemisinin. And artemisinin is an extract, an extract from the Chinese plant Qinghao. And again, in the primary treatment of COVID, we talk about the use of artemisinin, which is from Qinghao, which is an herb that was used in the Shanghai epidemic that the famous doctor Tu Youyou in the 20th century determined how to extract artemisinin from Qinghao and then to develop the pharmaceutical artemisinin, which is an anti-malarial drug. And we use that in the treatment of COVID. We use artemisinin 
but it's available, it's availability, as opposed to the prescription or permissive. Okay, so you'd have to continue that for eight to ten weeks after the symptoms. Okay. Um, so there's a note here. What is this, Jonathan? Uh, specific dosage information. Well, yeah, I, I think in, in seeing this list of herbs, um, is there a place you would recommend people to refer to if they want to prepare the, the herbs for all is, or order them? Okay, this is a standard formula. Renshin Baidusan is a standard formula that it shows up in most herbal um, formularies. It shows up in uh, what we use in the United States, which is Bensky, uh, which is a large, one of the large herbal compendiums that's been put together. Um, it shows up in Chinese standard pharmacopias. It's been an accepted standard dosage situation for 400 years. So in that sense, that's a very common formula. So I didn't put down the, the ingredients or the dosage, dosage, I should say, because it's a pretty set, pretty set form. I listed the ingredients here um, simply because in the previous lecture, I had put the same slide in about the convalescence and included the ingredients there. Most importantly, you look at the ingredients in case they're on pharmaceuticals to check for herb drug interactions, right? But this is, but Wrench and Baidusan being so standard, right? Yes, thank you. You know, I realize this, it's, it's Wrench and Baidusan, that's not by not Daidusan, but that's me not being able to type. So yes, that's correct here where I said it correctly higher up and I made a little typo there. So please don't get confused by the typo. Nonetheless, so I'd have to refer you to standard references for the, the dosages, but generally speaking, the herb suppliers, at least that we use in the United States, have this formula, even in raw form, pre-made, ready to go in packs, ready to go at set dosage, at set amounts of the herb. The dose, of course, being dependent then, you'd have to scale up or scale down based on the body weight, but they have the 140 pound base set and then they can scale up or down. So that's kind of maybe a little bit outside of okay um a little bit outside of what we can cover right here okay so if you've gone through herbal training and past the herbal boards and such you probably memorize this formula at one point in your life so all right but let's continue on so we continue the artemisinin for eight to ten weeks now artemisinin if you are breastfeeding you can take that that's fine that's not going to interfere with that at all uh, but artemisinin is an extract at 100 milligrams per 140 pounds or per 63 kilograms at 100 milligrams of artemisinin daily. You cannot take artemisinin forever. You can't live on it. It's a medicine. So after the eight weeks, at the most 12 weeks, you have to go off of it. Otherwise, because it is an antimicrobial, it will give you diarrhea, as just like antibiotics do. All right, so, but this is after you get it, convalescent. Now, we go beyond that, and let's talk about the sequela and the sequela patterns, the different patterns that can occur with the sequela, right? So this is a list, certainly, but it's a list so you can identify what is there and say, oh, this could be COVID, because right now, COVID's in the news all the time. Patients come in and say, I had COVID, and now I have this. But they might, two years from now, three years from now, four years from now, have some of these things, and they might be like, they might not associate it with COVID, and they may not necessarily have realized and if this stealth COVID as it's been called that has no symptoms they may think that I just have a problem and not associate it to COVID and maybe they never got a COVID test so you're going to have to start asking that in your intakes you ever have COVID hmm. did you have when how long was it how bad was it there's no correlation to how bad it is and how much you get a sequela that's the complicated Let's walk through this and then we walk through how to treat it. So, Dr. Arden, before you get to these, uh, there is an interest here in uh, what kind of acupuncture points and techniques one might use for the convalescent stage. Okay, let's go back. So, please also realize that generally speaking, most of TCM as done in the People's Republic and such it is herbs. So most of the research is on herbs. Acupuncture is more often considered like physical therapy. So it isn't used the same way as it might be used in other countries as a primary av avenue of TCM. It is in, 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 in China and in Korea. It's, it's the 
and in Vietnam also, it, acupuncture is the secondary uh, aspect of TCM, while herbs are the primary. So a lot of stuff we have on herbs. But here, if you're talking about the convalescent phase, ultimately, if you have circulation issues and you, they predominate, you're talking about blood stasis. So you're talking about mostly blood stasis, a blood stasis with an attendant chi deficiency. In that regard, the premier points that are often used for blood stasis, which is bladder 17 and 19, the four flowers, could certainly be used to help that person. Then they, as well as spleen 10, that three point combination is often used for blood stagnation, right? So the other part of it, the other side of it, is that they have an attendant chi deficiency because they're run down. So the tendency chi deficiency, well, we have to be careful because we need to strengthen chi. If you strengthen chi when blood is stagnant, often you exacerbate the symptoms because we all know chi is the commander of blood, blood is the grounding of chi. And as such, if you strengthen the chi when the blood is stagnant, it doesn't want to move correctly and your symptoms get worse, even though you might be getting better, your symptoms are worse for a while. So we'd have to be cautious when we strengthen chi. In that sense, we certainly can use the infamous stomach 36, but more so, you probably want to focus on bladder 24, because bladder 24 on the back, Guan Yuan Shu, is the back shoe point for Qi. It encourages Qi, excuse me, Qi Hai Shu, not Guan Yuan Shu, that's 26, Qi Hai Shu. So it is the back shoe point for the sea of Qi. So we'd probably be working on bladder 17 and 19, more dispersive technique, or depending on your needle technique, you could do harmonizing needle technique, which is where the needle is used and it's used to move horizontally, like stirring a pot. Same on spleen 10. But if you're going to the points of strength and chi, if you're in the circulation issue dynamic, such as stomach 36 or such as bladder 24, right? Things that encourage the chi, or even if you were to go to the lung for lung masters the chi and went to lung nine, you'd want to do even method on them. You don't want to do a strong tonification because of the presence of the blood stasis. And as the blood stasis eases up, you certainly would tonify the chi more, okay? Now, if the, if the fatigue is the issue, right, then we're seeing that where we do the wrench and, okay. So the retention depends on the technique, meaning you don't retain a set amount of time with every technique. The more sophisticated your hand technique, your shofa, the less time you retain the needle. So if you do a tonification or a dispersion, you do a dispersion that's very forceful and moves a lot, then you don't have to leave the needle so long. The needle time is a tool, time's an operative tool to make change. So if you work the needle in the direction, pro-meridian flow or counter-meridian flow, then you need more time, right? That's the other thing, you need more time if you have pro-meridian flow um, versus uh, a counter-meridian flow, then time is your tool, in which case you're thinking, Often, traditionally, one movement of a clepsera, the water clock, which on the Western clock is 25 and one quarter minutes. So you have to break 25 and a half minutes to cross that line. So if you're just using angulation, it's a longer retention, 25 minutes. If you are using hand technique, you scale down the retention, perhaps to none, if you vigorously can do it. But someone, convalescent phase, a bit run down, probably can't take very intense treatment someone who's stronger also often in orthopedics we stimulate and take the needle right back out but here we're probably going to retain so we're probably looking at the, the about a 10 minute maybe 14 minute 15 minute retention after dispersing the ones for blood stasis and doing even method even method is needle in and just get dodgy and then stop remember needle in dodgy then you do your technique you got dodgy turn it on get the chi to come to it then you do your technique so ping fa or even method is needle in, da chi, stop. Okay. So, but if the, that, so that would be for the circulation issues. If the fatigue issues predominate, well, then they are underlyingly chi deficient. And at the same time, they have this lingering type of infection. So what you'd need to do there is you'd need to do more tonifying. Here's where your stomach 36 comes back to help you and your large intestine 10. The stomach 36 is Zhu San Li, leg three mile point, large intestine 10 is Shou San Li, arm three mile point. And in combination, they are called the, the Da Bu Xue, which is the, the great tonification points put together. They mirror each other, 
in which case you tonify them. So your needle will go in, dachi, strengthen them. Now, at the same time, because this has been an, an infectious pathogen, you need to strengthen lung, often using lung five. Lung five is the he point. We often say he si in English, he point. He point is the point on the channel where the meridian and the organ unify their functionality. So you could tonify lung five because that's the core strength in the lung, right? So the tonifying of lung five, fine. But then at the same time, you still have to get this out. So you would then turn to something such as lung seven, lower point on lung, which drains to take it out. Lung seven and large intestine six, lower point on the large intestine, because lung and large intestine, of course, lung deals with the lung, large intestine runs up into the sinuses. This was something that was a nasopharyngeal infection originally. So you go lung six. And then stomach 40. Why stomach 40? Because it drains the yang ming, and stomach 40 often used to drain phlegm, dispersed. And finally, adding to that bladder 58. Why bladder? All of the law points stimulated by themselves. The And that's how things exit the body. That's Huang Chi. You never give a Chinese herb by itself. Common formulas. Uh, the, right? the, so, uh, so, the sorry for pausing you. You you start speaking of the low point, low points, and uh, then we all lost you. Got stuck. The connection was a little bit bad. So if you could repeat uh, once you start speaking of the low, low points. Okay, fine. So as I mentioned just now, when we're dealing with this fatigue predominant convalescence. You'd want to tonify ones that help chi and then drain and disperse several of the law points to get the remnants of the pathogenic influence out of the body. The law points I mentioned were lung seven, large intestine six, stomach 40, and bladder 58. Law points in general drain to the bladder, and the bladder is what expels pathogens. So it lets them out of the body. So you'd want to drain all of those to dispersive technique. So you're having a, a combination, several tonifying things, several dispersive things. Okay. So does that make sense? Does that answer the question, Jonathan? Yes, certainly. Uh, also, there is a question about Huang Qi, and a few people have right. asked me about the treatment of children during the convalescent phase. Okay. So Huang Qi, Huang Qi is strengthens Lung Qi. Huang Qi is not as strong as Ren Shen or Dang Shen to strengthen the core. Huang Qi, and remember, Chinese herbs are never, almost never, almost never given alone. They're given in formulas, formulas that have certain levels of complexity. Huang Qi would be inappropriate for convalescent phase by itself because convalescent phase has the combination of things where there's a deficiency, an ongoing lingering aspect of some pathogen. So that's why we use Renchen Baidusan which is carefully structured to take care of both things. Now, would it be possible to substitute Huang Qi for Ren Shen? Perhaps, but it would not be as strong because Huang Qi is not as warming, right? Huang Qi does not have that same tonifying strength, nor does Dang Shen, which is often substituted for Ren Shen because of price, right? But also, as I mentioned when we started, we used the predominance of this, these methodologies are based on available pills. Why? Pills are fast. Pills have higher compliance among the patient population that we see in the United States. And they also tend to be produced very carefully. Generally speaking, we do not like to have patients boil herbs by themselves. That is not what we like as standard of care. We like the companies to boil them, to do what are called vacuum seals. company will boil them because they those are the people who boil them specifically accurately and at least at our university we have this amount of dietary sugar they're on a dextrin base and so we've done research at the university you know looking at the amount of sugar in them and we across the board 
as a clinical practice, do not prescribe uh, any granules. Doc, please, if you can, if you may repeat the last 20 seconds, we all lost you again. The last 20, hard for me to count back 20 seconds. When you began speaking about the, uh, the pharmacies preparing the herbs for the okay. patients. So we tend to, right, we tend to, as best practice, not want the patient to boil the herbs themselves because they are not compliant to the soaking and boiling schedule perfectly. And so many of the pharmacies in the United States will boil them, they call it a vacuum seal, and it produces a little plastic pack that looks like a juice pack, and it has the herbs in it, pre-made, and the person has to just take them, put the herbs, the little pack in warm water to warm it, and then drink it down. That's our preferred method for giving raw herbs because we know it's been boiled correctly by professionals. And I don't trust 90-year-old Mrs. Johnson to boil them herself, okay? So that's one part to it. The other aspect is that um, we, at the university where I work, we do not prescribe granular extracts. We have moved away. We don't use that at all because the granular extract herbs are based on dextrin, sugar. So they're based out of sugar. So they have enormous amounts of dietary sugar. So the sugar starts to change the effect of the formula. The sugar is problematic. We have a large amount of the people in the United States who are pre-diabetic and diabetic. And we don't like to give them dietary sugar in that granular format. So we've done research. I led a research team on the amount of sugar. And many of those formulas are almost 90% sugar when you do the granular. Additionally, they corrupt very quickly. And although they are supposedly to have a 10-year shelf life, if unopened, once opened, many of them will corrupt within three to five days to be unsafe for human consumption due to microbial proliferation of the herbs in the granular sugar base. So we've moved away from that and we're doing further research to see if we can develop a different base to make them safer. It's also why Lynn Sister, one of the most famous pharmacies in New York City, run by two pharmacists who have had 40 years of experience, Chinese pharmacists, they won't sell the granulars. They, they said these are not safe. They, the, the corruption dynamics are, make them very unsafe. So here again, pills. Also, tinctures are not well researched. So we, in the, that's not considered standard of care, though they're produced by the companies. The People's Republic does not embrace them. Um, we, don't, uh, we don't teach them at my university at all. Um, we don't use tinctures because tinctures are not Chinese traditional formulations. Um, and they also have alcohol as a base. So in something such as COVID that adversely affects the liver, we don't want to give something that has an alcohol base. Okay, so, so we're very specific in what we do and we tend to use pill form. And so in pill forms, we don't really make the substitutions that you can make, especially because of the speed and the need for compliance. Right? So those things are, are issues that are right there. Okay? Now, could Huang Chi embedded in a formula similar to Renshin Baidusan operate? Perhaps. But then you'd have to go through and reconstruct a formula and resolve a problem that we solved a problem for. So in that sense, as you know, medicine is expediency. How quick, how fast, how efficient you can help someone. So this is the convalescent phase. It's only two weeks. Before we go, we still have to get to the COVID sequela. And that's where you can have more freedom in designing a formula. But here, we tend to stick to protocol because as you may be aware that in that, the way we practice TCM in the modern way is protocol-based. There are set protocols for set conditions, set things that we tend to do for a condition that comes up repeatedly. So this is a protocol to let you work quickly. This is how we've seen over a thousand people like this, working in protocol format and reevaluating the protocols as they as we go along. So I hope that answers the question, but I'm going to keep moving. All right. So. Yeah, Doc, I'd like to remind that there was a, there were a few people asking me about the treatment of children. Sure. Convalescent phase with this treatment of children is the same underlying principles, the same thing we have here. 
but you have to dose down by body weight and then further reduce. So ch children are not only reduced by body weight, the, the general principle in TCM pediatrics is half begun is done. Half of what you think you need to do for half as much time. So for convalescent phase for children, you could still use the same formulas. You take the dose down, of course, to body weight, but then drop it even lower, maybe to half their body weight. If, that's a little on the low side, but maybe two thirds body weight dependent dosing, but for a shorter time. Instead of 10 days to two weeks, we're talking five days to seven days because their bodies are chun yang, pure yang, and change more quickly. So in pediatrics, everything doses reduced. Same with pediatric needling, right? So in pediatric needling, the same points could be used. Needle techniques are much more shallow. Retention times are almost none. You manipulate and take out, depending how young the child is. But also you might split the points between one side and another. So therefore you even lower the dose more so, right? By having the dose, by taking one side versus the other. So hopefully that answers the pediatric question. So now let's keep moving on. The sequela, let's talk about the sequela patterns, right? So neurologically, very commonly, sensory deficits, cognitive deficits, proprioceptive deficits, which means you can't balance, insomnia, increased risk of stroke. Those are all issues right there, okay? Um, all right, so the aspect with this, I'll give you a clinical vignette, I've had, I had two real cl clear clinical vignettes. Person had COVID, young, young person, she was 26, had COVID with about 10 days after COVID. She was a little numb, legs were a little numb, but she had been in bed. All right. She got up, she couldn't walk right. She kept falling. Her left leg wouldn't fire. It, she walked, you, you would think she had MS or some neurological concern, right? Um, so she fell over, almost broke her elbow. She's 26. She was referred to see me. I looked at this. Okay. Her con she was past the convalescent phase, but she was basically presented with aspects of blood stasis, as we're going to talk about in a minute when we get to the protocols for treating convalescents. The blood stasis. So we treated her for blood stasis and treating her for blood stasis, though she did not show the clear blood static signs. She showed some of them, but not a complete picture. And the thing is, it looked like she had weakness and fatigue, but the blood static dynamic underneath it was interfering in her neural system. So moving the blood stasis, giving her a prescription of Yunnan Biao, right, which is blood static, and then followed with Tao Hong Su Tang, and also giving her acupuncture specifically to move the blood in the gallbladder channel. And within approximately seven, six, seven days, her four weeks of falling over stopped and her, she got rid of the numbness and her balance normalized. Okay. We've also seen multiple patients who have cognitive deficit. Often after COVID, they can't do math. Where I've had people who six months later are still unable to do addition after COVID. They, they, they're, they're not clear. And this presents as a sub pattern of the blocking of the orifices known as blood stasis blocks the orifices. Normally we talk about phlegm. Phlegm missed the mind and blocks the orifices of the mind. It is possible to have blood stasis miss the mind. That is a sub pattern, sub pattern of, of uh, occlusion of blood stasis in the mansion of the chest, right? Which is upper burner blood stasis. So a prescription of shui fu tzu yu tang, right? Drive out stasis from the mansion of the chest decoction was resolved the the cognitive dissonance and the cognitive deficit. So that's usually you use shui fu chu tang for heart disease, but using it here, clear the orifices. Okay, now in acupuncture, that would be treating bladder 15, by right, bladder 17 and 19, by right, bloodletting those areas, as well as clearing the orifices, which is historically done with heart five, stomach 40, dispersing all those very strongly. Okay. So what I'm gonna go through and just mention these so we can get to the protocol and we can come back to specific ones after we go through protocol, okay? So pulmonary things, scarring, volume deficit, can't take a full breath. 
I, as, as Jonathan mentions, I coach martial arts and one of my martial arts students who's in his 20s got COVID pretty asymptomatically where he had a little runny nose. He was like, oh, I'm okay, gave him herbs. Afterwards, for almost a month and a half, <gasps> couldn't breathe in. It's a young, healthy man, couldn't breathe in. Couldn't breathe fully, I should say. So we had to, and, and he had gone to see someone, not me, he had seen someone who gave him something thinking it was like asthmatic, gave him glitchadabotam, which is for asthma. Didn't have the effect. Oh, we enhanced the glitchadabotam by adding sanchi, the herb that resolves blood stasis. And within about five days, he was, his lung capacity returned. So again, the key to this is, as we're gonna see, blood blood, I treat the blood, okay? All right, then cardiac, right? So cardiac problems, edema, blood pressure dysregulation, risk of infarction, hematologic issues, anemia, right? Morbid morphologies of blood, so those the blood is misshapen. Now, unless you're pulling labs and looking at the, you know, RDW and the size and whatnot, you wouldn't necessarily know about the morbid morphology of the blood, unless you're pulling the labs. But if you pull the labs, depending on how you practice and you look at the lab work, then you'd be able to see that, okay? Further, nephrology, filtration issues, okay? Um, let's see, so for many symptoms. So here the thing, the thing is someone put in the chat about, about the vaccine. The vaccine has a very different presentation. Um, and the vaccine, there is Dr. Ray Hong's protocol for post-vaccine. That's that's people using that we, that the, the, a colleague of mine, Dr. Ray Hong, pioneered. Then we ran it through our test group, and now that's spread all over the country. And so, if you don't know that uh, protocol, post-vaccine, vaccine doesn't produce the same thing as COVID. The vaccine is the mRNA. I'm talking mostly the mRNA vaccine, which is incredibly safe. And you know, but the mRNA vaccine will produce a heat signature as most vaccinations do. And it's very, can be very intense and can cause some consumptive blood signs, but it's a heat signature, not a blood damage. We're talking about COVID as a blood damage because COVID blinds to heme. So the, the, the Hong protocol, Dr. Ray Hong, H-O-N-G, he developed the protocol after the vaccine, you, as soon as possible, it can be longer, but as soon as possible, people will go to see him or people will do his method after the vaccine. You needle all of the earth points on all 12 channels. You needle all of them. You insert, no stimulation, 45 minutes retention. And that, across the board, almost 100% resolves post-vaccine syndrome. Because earth is the child of fire. And it clears fire gently from all of the 12 channels. So needling the earth points and then retaining them. So we pioneered this, we brought it to our research group. We all worked with it. We've seen lots of people post-vaccine, if you have post-vaccine syndrome, that is, that is a preferred protocol. So that I know has been used in well over 500 cases that, that our research group has brought back and said, yeah, this is, this is what works. So use that if you have people post-vaccine that even if it's a bit after, I know of cases that have been like five weeks after vaccination that still have irritation syndromes and still have issues and have used that protocol because it leaches fire. Now, generally speaking, all vaccinations produce heat. That's how we treat in pediatrics. So we often use doucher sign, guide out the red powder as something if they have an ongoing vaccine reaction. But that's very different than COVID because the vaccine is not a live virus. Um, the, the one closest to it, the Chinese Liu Xing, um, uh, vaccine is a dead COVID virus. That one, I really, to be honest, don't know because even the Chinese will use it, but they're using it sparingly now that the mRNA technology is available for it. So if you had the Lu Xing, would that present more like COVID with blood damage or would it you know, be more like a, uh, would it be more like the other ones? Um, that's, that I'm not sure, okay? And that would have to do more research on. Everyone would like, just like to mention, Given that the vaccines are a very controversial topic, and it is also not the topic of this presentation, then please let us not focus on that. Uh, I apologize. We have a wide variety of opinions on th this subject, and let's move on with the COVID sequelae. 
All right, so we keep moving. The um, nephrology, kidney issues, filter, filtration deficits occur. You can't filter correctly. Your, your uh, urine is not working correctly. Your bilirubin counts start to change all sorts of issues. That's both liver and uh, kidney, and you wind up having a, a, a improper eradication of wastes. In Chinese medicine, of course, that's the ye huaji, the fluid transformative mechanism where fluids separate and urine is produced. Muscular issues, attenine atrophy disorder, right? That is Way syndrome is often associated with this, okay? Um, the arthritis and arthralgia will often come up because of the issues that occur with the circulation and the impedance of the joints. Hepatic issues, liver scarring, blood filtration, again, deficits that are going on there, right? And then that's where the bilirubin count skyrocket. You don't purge dead blood because remember the liver, Western thought, purges dead blood. Chinese thought that's more of a gallbladder function, but those are conjoined together in the wood phase, right? Hormonal deficits seem to come up. I've seen a lot of trans people who have a lot of strange results after having had COVID because it interferes with some of their, their, their hormone therapy. So normalizing liver blood using something like gusha tang seems to help that go back to normal for the liver to be, because liver, of course, is related to the endocrine system. Reproductive uh, issues. Uh, uh, two things, sorry. Uh, first of all, the, the formula you just mentioned, could you kindly write it in the chat? Go shot to your tongue, sure. Go shot. Good so if you, if you could kindly repeat uh, what it is indicated for specifically in the context of the sequelae. Gushatsuyutang means uh, drive out stasis from beneath the diaphragm decoction. It is used for stasis in the middle, affecting mostly the liver and the center of the body, has large indications for liver's ability to store blood, process blood, and gallbladder's ability to dredge the blood or clean the blood. In Western medicine, we say the liver bile salts are secreted to break down the blood that the liver has filtered. And in Chinese medicine, we say that the gallbladder, which is the major catabolic drive in the blood, dredges the blood. We associate it differently, but it is still the bile salts. Okay. So, but the, that formula is used often for menstrual problems with, with clotting. It's used for liver blood stagnation. It can be modified to be used for use syndrome. In this situation of sequela patterns, we can use it for issues where the blood stasis of liver interferes with the hormones. As I mentioned, patients I've seen who are trans, who are taking different types of hormone-based medications or medications regarding hormones, um, often after COVID, those medications aren't working the quite the way that they would because the liver is impeded. So Gusha Tsuyutang can help normalize liver function. And for people who are on hormone therapy, seems to help a lot to normalize their body's response to their hormone therapy. All right. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, one minor question from Galia. I should like a cl clarification. Uh, concerning the uh, patient who was your st uh, student of yours in your in his twenties with a difficulty uh, taking a full breath, was he eventually treated with a combination of uh, Renchen Baidusan plus Sanchi? Well, he he was actually we treated him with um, Gusha Dabutang, which is a Guja Dabutang, Guja Dabutang, because by the time he came, he was past the convalescent phase. Right, he was past convalescence. So it was it was Guja Dabutang, which I'll throw in the chat for you guys. Guja Dabutang, which is one of the major formulas um, for asthma. Right? Guja Dabutang, plus we added the San Chi, and that's what got his lung capacity back. Right? That's gecko Ever, brain fortification formula. Ever Vital is asking, uh, with respect to Gesia Juyutang, whether it would be appropriate for women during their menopause who are taking hormones. It would be, but they'd have to have a blood stasis presentation. Okay, but that goes outside the COVID sequela. So, but the short answer is yes, but again, if they have blood stasis, it's a blood static resolving formula. If you don't have blood stasis, you know, because hormone dysregulation can occur from a number of reasons, inclusive if they're perimenopausal or menopausal, right, the loss of yin. Right, as they transition from a more balanced metabolism to purely yin at the geriatric phase, in which case you might need formulas that balance out the yin. So, but I'm gonna keep moving because we've got about an hour, maybe a little less than an hour, a little less than an hour, and we've got to get to those protocols. 
so to where we got to get to, we can always come back to the questions on the approaches. So let's do this. I'm going to go past these, which is the list of the different things. And let's go to the issue. Oh, hold on a second. What happened here? Hold on. Something happened. There is a, there is a sound on this one. I have a recording in here. Give me one second. Sorry about that. Where is that sound? All right. There's a problem because there's sound in that slide, which I did not want to have. Where is it hiding? Huh. Well, we're going to have to play from current slide. From current slide. Okay. All right. So this is the Qi transformative mechanism. This is a review. I'm going to skip this slide over this slide. Come on. Why are you going so slow? Okay. Let's go right to the blood. This is the blood transformative mechanism. All right. There. This is the blood transformative mechanism. I want to go right to here. We'll talk about this and we can always go back to those other lists. So the, this is a review of the blood, the Shui Hua Ji, how blood is made in TCM. All right. So in TCM, to the stomach comes the Shui, the water. The spleen Qi escorts the water out. And that's now called jin ye, the thick and thin fluids, the normal function, the spleen yang and the kidney yang support the rising of the jin, and the ye descends to small intestine. And then in the upper burner, the gu qi, which is from the food, that came from a earlier part of this equation, plus the jin, thin fluids, plus the yuan qi, the source qi, combining together by heart heat, makes shui, blood. Now, there's a lot of support to that in the rest of the metabolism, as we can see in this diagram, and you studied in your fundamental theory of your schooling, that the jing, the essence that's betwixt the kidneys, has to move through the mingmen, the ordinance gate, the gate of vitality, into the system originally called yuan qi, spring well qi, moving up called kidney yang, to make the heartbeat and changing names, and then driving back down. So the bottom line in this is that there's a support that's occurring between the kidneys, between the digestive tract, stomach, and the spleen, and between the heart. So the kidney, the spleen, and the heart are all responsible for this mechanism operating correctly. Then you need the proper nutrient base. You need the gu qi, the nutrient base, the jin, the thin clear fluids, and some of your source qi, your genetic material, to be able to create blood. Okay, why should we go over this, this basic theory? Because in COVID sequela, this is interfered with, that the blood producing metabolism is interfered with, and there's attendant blood stasis due to the COVID binding to the heme molecule. Those two things combine together to cause a problem. So let's just review, put it in your heads. Okay, now let's talk about blood pathologies. Then we can start getting into the protocols of what we do. Then we can always go back to all the variant manifestations. So we all know blood can be deficient, shui chu. Blood can be stagnant, shui yu. Right, we know that there's sub three subcategories of blood stagnation, right? There's blood stagnation in the chest, right? Shong Zhong Shui Yu. There's blood there's stagnation and binding in the gastrium, that's Wei Wan Yu Jie, and then there's stagnation and binding in the lower abdomen, Sha Wan Yu Jie. Right? These are the three subcategories of basic blood stagnation. Now, as you studied this in fundamental theory, you also realize that there's blood heat Shui Yu. So these three pathologies: deficiency, stagnation, blood heat three primary pathologies of blood are all called primary pathologies because they can cross fertilize each other. In other words, you can become blood deficient and it can produce blood stagnation or blood heat, or you can become blood stagnant initially. It can produce blood deficiency and blood heat, or you can get blood heat. It can produce blood stagnation or blood deficiency. You can start anywhere of those three into the cycle of troubles with blood. It's not the same thing with qi. Qi becomes excess or deficient, then it stagnates or it sinks. And then stagnating, it produces heat. And then producing heat, it goes. So the Qi has a different pathological cascade. The blood has this pathological cascade that blood deficiency, stagnation, or blood heat all can be primary pathologies where you start from. Now, there's the other two pathologies are listed here. Channel obstruction, Jing Lo Zhu Zhi, right? The channels are obstructed. As the channels are obstructed by blood, that can be peripheral. That can be you bang yourself. 
to hurt yourself. That maybe has nothing to do with your core, but that's not what we treat COVID. But the channels can be obstructed due to problems on the inside. Now, since these three pathologies can create each other, it's possibly be blood deficient on the inside, and channel obstructed on the outside, or blood stagnant on the inside, and channel obstructed on the outside, or blood heat on the inside, often shown with bleeding, and channel obstructed on the outside. Okay, let's just review. Then, last is blood desertion, or known as collapse, shui tuo. That's where the blood system shuts down and you die. Now, in COVID, we don't see that in sequela. We, don't, we haven't seen so much that the problems with blood kill the person afterwards. COVID can kill someone. Often they die because of problems in their lung, right? But this dynamic has to be listed here because it's possible that this could contribute over time if unchecked because of damage to the blood to eventually leading to shui tuo, to blood collapse, which is often death from heart disease or death from, from a stroke. This is often a problem where the blood matrix starts to shut down. Okay. Now let's get into the nitty gritty. Let's get into the mix. Okay, so we talk talking about the blood, right? So the blood in TCM has a broader range of functions as described in Western medicine. You're aware of that. You know that. You all went to school. COVID-19 damages the blood can lead to broad ranging symptomologies, many of which seem unrelated. Right? And this is one of the reasons why we want to study this theoretically. And then how do we apply to it? Central to treating COVID sequela, you have to address the blood matrix and repair the function and formation of the blood. And this is the thing that you came to listen to. This is what brought you in. Not just, oh, what do they feel? How do I fix it? You must address the blood. This is, as I called it forth, this is in the classical period. We would call this the shang shui lun, the damage to blood theory. Okay. The blood is not addressed and only symptoms are chased. There's no long lasting eradication, me, eradication of the problem and varied pathologies will reassert. In other words, you don't get rid of the problem in the blood, you'll solve one thing, it'll pop out somewhere else. It's kind of like you don't capture the bad guy and it comes out differently, okay? So I mentioned that student before who had the lung issue. Well, he was being treated with gojadabutam, which is for asthma because the person interpreted that, oh, he had trouble breathing. It should work in a normal, healthy metabolism, but it didn't work because it didn't address the blood stasis commitment to COVID. Now, four weeks after he had had COVID, past the convalescent phase, enhancing that formula with something that addressed blood, it gave the result that we wanted. That's the key to treating COVID sequela. The blood has to be addressed, okay? And we have some protocols on this. It's a broad ranging impact of the blood on other symptoms. So the blood pathology can impact the function of all three burners, as we saw listed on that other basic slide, right? Including qi transformative mechanism, how you make qi. The digestive mechanism in general, how you digest, how nutrients come in. The free movement of the yin or nutritive qi that must move from the middle burner after it's synthesized in the upper burner, the spleen yang must move the nutritive qi that can become impeded from this. And remember, in the periphery, the yin moves just above the blood. So if the blood is stagnant in the channels, right, that jing lo zhu zhi, the blood is stagnant in the channels, then the ying or nutritive qi will not move correctly and you'll be not only exhausted, but have nutritive issues and that may lead to atrophy atomy disorder. Also the fluid transformative mechanism, which is a ye hua ji, which is how the ye fluids go down in the lower burner to be separated into clear and turbid, producing urine, and draining out the system through the bladder, draining out the, the toxins from the bladder. That can become blocked from the blood. And further, the peripheral meridian flow. So all these systems can be impeded, in which case people will present with many different and cross-transformative types of pathologies. If you don't identify the blood as being the central pivot, you won't get rid of it. All right now, also, the blood is the matrix of the mind in TCM. We say that all the time, blood is the matrix of the mind, meaning circulation drives your consciousness, drives your brain function. Blood pathologies result in cognitive alterations and deficits, as we mentioned before. Additionally, the liver stores the blood in TCM. Blood pathology can directly impact liver function, physically and emotionally, because we know that the liver is the seat of the emotions. So you can develop U syndrome, which is U syndrome is repressive emotional disorder. Right? As blood formation also includes UN chi from the kidneys, like we saw in that chart. Blood pathology eventually taxes the kidney reserves. So if you get COVID sequela, you're not kidney deficient to start with. 
you'll get there. They'll tax your core base. All right, now, how do we fix this? Right, so we got to talk about taxonomy of it, and here's where we get into the nuts and bolts. So the taxonomy of COVID-19 sequela has three parts. First, you have to be addressed or assessed to determine if you're in a malarial state or a lingering pathogenic state. And we have a slide that separates this, a malarial state or a lingering pathogenic state. Okay, then the blood has to be further typified, deficient or excess. Then the attendant system or systems of compromise must be determined and differentially diagnosed. And that's all the ones I had that list on that other set of slides as to all the different things you gotta be on the lookout for, right? And those have to be parsed and treated. But this is a three-part taxonomy. It yields a three-part differentiated treatment strategy for the sequela of COVID-19. So this is really the nuts and bolts of what we have to go through today so you are clear in how to approach the patients. This is what they call a zhong yi si shang, which is a Chinese medical thought tool. That's a core idea. How you think is the power of TCM. Not necessarily what you do, how you think. Because if you figure it out and think clearly, there's books on acupuncture points and books on herbs and books on formulas, and there's resources. But if you don't know the strategy, all those resources can't get put in play. That's what we're after, strategy. Like playing soccer, or I guess football if you call it football, right? It's pretty simple. Kick the ball into the goal, got it. But there's all these guys who stop you from doing that. So the strategy, how you get down the field and what you do is how you win the game. Same thing with COVID. All right, so let's get onto this. So let's talk now. Step one, how you treat it. Determine the state of sequela. There's two, there's a bifurcation here. There's a taxonomy, right? There's a, it's a yin and yang, one or the other, okay? The malarial state, right? Whether they're in the malarial state or they're in the lingering pathogen state. And I put quotation marks around malarial state, okay? Why? Because it's not malaria. They didn't get bit by the fly and get the malaria, but we call it Nui Bing, Nui, actually Nui Zheng, which is malaria type staging. Okay, also these slides, I'm giving them to Jonathan as a PDF. He's gonna put them out there. Here's the thing, it's a pandemic. We all gotta work together. Right? No one of us is smart enough to fix this whole thing. All of us together, hopefully, are smart enough to you know, do this. I heard someone speaking, and I thought this was very true. They said, the devil doesn't send plagues. God does. They said, why would God do such a thing? To force us to work together and find the, the divine within ourselves to help others. So maybe I'm not that, 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 that innocent to think that completely is true. But at the same time, the, the, the challenges of this test our humanity. So we all got to work together and, you know, such like that. So after you, you, we finish all that, you know, um, finish studying this and you get stuck with a patient, you know, you can get in touch with me. I'll do my best to help you with that. And, you know, I, I treat COVID patients all the time and don't charge them. It's just, we got to fix this thing. Okay. So it's a challenge to us. All right. So I'll get off my little soapbox there. Get back to work. Okay. So malarial state, right? So what is a malarial state? This is when you're weak. You're weak and the pathogen is unresolved. So you're weak, your reserves are down and the pathogen gets to hang out because you don't have enough fight. So it's like, man, you, you, the pathogen thinks, I won, you kick him back. He's sitting there. Maybe he's not strong enough to take over the whole system, but he thinks he won, okay? The pathogen is lodged in the regular meridians. Put that in your head, make a note somewhere in the regular meridians, the regular Jing law, the ones you normally work with in acupuncture, working with the regular meridians. That's important because that's where you're gonna find it. That's where you're gonna take the fight to it, okay? And the networks, networks means the law, the connections between the meridians, the meridians and the connections. The patient worsens with rest and improves when fatigued. What? When they rest, they're worse because their body can fight it. Then when they're fatigued and they gotta go to work and they gotta go out and they gotta do things, they get tired and the symptoms go away. That's what you gotta look for. That's how you know malarial state. The tongue doesn't show the pathology. Tongue doesn't help you, sorry. But the pulse worsens. It's more pathological when they rest. It gets, when they rest, it gets more rapid. It gets more tight. It gets more worse. And when they're fatigued, the pulse gets more moderate, more normal. 
That's not right. You can identify that. We have another slide that clarifies it more. But let's look at the lingering pathogen state because that's a different presentation, right? This state, the LPF lingering, this is Zhou Bing in Chinese, lingering pathogen state. This is due to a weak pathogen that remains hidden in the metabolism. This is different. The pathogen's weak. Metabolism's kind of strong, not bad, right? It's hidden from the normal pathways. It goes in the divergent channels. Remember, the divergent channels break off the regular channels and go running under other structures, right? So it hides in there. It's kind of like hiding on a back street. It's like, it's like a little terrorist going to a terrorist cell. It's like, I got to hide out until I get my buddies back and attack again. This is weird. I can't find it. This patient worsens when they're fatigued because when they're fatigued, the pathogen says, it's my chance. I'm back. It comes running back out. But it improves. When you rest, your body fights it back off. And it, but it doesn't go away. It lingers. Okay. The back of the tongue will show small raised dots that reflects the pathology. In the back, they look like little mountains. They pop up, little mountains. But the pulse doesn't show anything. The pulse doesn't show this clearly. But the, the tongue shows little, little pathogen enclaves hidden somewhere. It doesn't work well for what area? They're all in the back. Even though they're not, not all the problems are in the kidney but they're all in the back, these little ridges. They look like little mountains pop up, okay? And they will go away if you fix them. Now, here's a picture. The picture's worth a thousand words, at least I hope so, right? The malarial state. Malarial state here, the, the three burners are represented with the blue, the orange, orange is yellow, and the red. So of course, Jing Chi Shen, it's the best I got. I don't draw well and that's the best I got. This is the most sophisticated picture I could make for you, right? Then the upper burner, the person, right, the disease process interacts with the upright chi, right, the, in the malarial state. You're asymptomatic because the disease, you see the pink represents the deficient. And then when you come up, when you get stronger, right, the symptoms come up. When you get weaker, the symptoms go down because there's no interaction between your chi and the pathogen chi. That's called the malarial state. Noi Bing. Okay. Now, if you know of malaria, malaria has these alternating episodes, this on and off, the remission. That's why when malaria, true malaria came in, the malaria, the malaria as we understand it in Western medicine, came in, they used this word for it because they had this concept of other diseases that caused this. Going back, it's mentioned in several chapters in the Huangdi Neijing that mentioned this 3,000 or more years ago, talking about this concept. Okay. We look at the other picture, lingering pathogen. Here, the weak pathogen, that pathogen's weak, right? And he waits, the body becomes deficient. That's why the upper burner now is pink. And that's why the middle burner is now not a hearty orange, but a pale yellow, because they're weak, they're run down. They're like all of us, working too hard, doing too much, trying to help all those patients, right? So you get run down and all of a sudden, you see little arrows, the pathogen pops out, thinking he's strong, he's not that strong, but he pops out. But once you get stronger, the pathogen's pushed back into hiding. The hiding one in the divergent channel, lingering pathogen in the divergent channel, malarial state in the regular channels. Just remember that. That's going to help us how we treat it. Okay. All right. So, uh, how do the white dots compare to other things? So, these are not white dots. These are not dots. Jonathan put in the chat, in the lingering pathogen dots, they're not dots morphology, the shape of the tongue changes, and it looks like a mountain. It looks expanded and it comes up, it pops up, it raises. Some people say, oh, it's taste buds. Eh. It comes up and it looks like a little mountain that came up, a little, a little spike, because something's hiding in there. This is not red dots, yellow dots on the coat, or not, 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 not paleness, nothing like that, not blood stagnant purple dots. They're literally changes in shape. The shape of the tongue changes. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. I'll try to, I wish I had put a picture of them in here. I didn't think of that, but I can get a picture, Jonathan, send you a picture. You can blast it out to everybody as what a picture of those look like, okay? All right. Okay, so now, now what do we do? We have this, we're getting closer to fixing it. So this is how we treat it. Well, in the malarial state, we have tonify. What? Yes, tonify to bring the condition into a pseudo-acute state. And the rubric is, stir the embers to extinguish the fire. 
right? That's what you've got to do. Once the pseudo-acute state is achieved, once you get there, then you switch to dispersive technique to resolve the malarial state completely. So you've got to basically strengthen the body enough that it's fighting up against the pathogen, and then you're going to take the pathogen out. They don't really get back into the acute stage. That's why I said pseudo-acute, because the pathogen is gone. From a Western perspective, the virus is dead. But the chi of the virus remains, because everything has chi. So the chi signature is there, though the, the viral presence is gone. Okay? So this is where we differ from Western medicine. We're talking about what they call qi zhuang tai in Chinese, which is the qi structural state. Okay, So that's this idea. Lingering pathogen, you have to do low-dose dispersion, slow, low-dose dispersion, and downward draining. Downward draining, which allows things to get taken out by the drainage system, okay, the bladder system. You have to get it out because it's hiding in the divergencies. You've got to drain it out. So the treatment course has to be attended specifically, which means they got to be on it. They got to follow your directions. They got to keep their appointments. You got to keep their appointments. They've got to follow the dosing schedule. It's also one of the reasons why we tend to use pills or pre-made liquids, because people are not careful, right? People don't always attend to their health. We're trying to do our best, and they got to stay on the schedule, right? So the pathogen's hiding. It could shift to other divergent channels if it's improperly resolved. It would be like the police coming to find some criminals and the criminals find out that the police, not all the police are coming to help and they sneak out the back and find another hideout, right? The same underlying metaphor, same underlying dynamic. Okay. So on we go. So this is now the technical thing of how we fix this aspect of it, right? So here, the treatment of the status of quality. In the malarial state, what do you do for acupuncture? Number 36. Does 10, we mentioned them already. Spring three, source point. Lung nine, source point. Ah, oh, strengthening, right? Lung five, hull point, the point that relates directly to the lung itself. Bladder 13, back shoot point for lung. Bladder 20, back shoot point for spleen. Bladder 21, for stomach. Tonify them. Tonify, tonify, tonify. This is just strengthening. Tonify by use of needle, by hand technique. Tonify by, by going with the meridian flow. However, you generally tonify. Tonify them, okay, and give them herbs, bajanta, a treasure decoction, okay. That's su tang plus su jun tang. It's a standard formula. I didn't put the ingredients up. You could look that one up easily. Or someone mentioned huang qi before. If you add huang qi and ro gui, bajanta, you get the famous formula shi chuan da bu tang. You could use that too, shi chuan da bu tang, if that's available. I know that the people from Trifolium came and spoke, and I'm sure. They have many of these set formulas that are right out of the classical formulary. I'm sure that they have versions of these that you could get, okay? Or I'm sure they were kind enough to say that they're, you know, willing to be responsive to practitioners. If they don't have them, I'm sure a little bit of research for an hour, they'd know the formulas and they could have them ready to rock and roll for you, okay? So, but here, don't fight, don't fight, don't fight. And then they're going to become pseudo-acute. You're going to feel like they're like, oh, I'm getting worse. I'm getting COVID again. I'm getting a headache, I'm getting the hot, I'm getting the, I'm getting the body aches, I'm getting, they feel like they're acute. That's when you switch. That's why you gotta be in contact with them and manage it. And now you go lung seven, low point, drain the lung. Lung five, disperse, get it out of the lung. Large intestine four, of course, because lung seven, large intestine four, law to source point, right? Those guys relate. Large intestine six, low point on large intestine. You're trying to get it from lung to large intestine, gone. Large intestine 11, because remember, COVID's a heat pathogen. Now we got to clear heat. Stomach 40, because that strains the Yang Ming, especially in concert with large intestine 6. A lot of 13 again, but now disperse. A lot of 20, but now disperse. A lot of 21, disperse. You have disperse, disperse, disperse. Now you switch your herbs. Now you switch to one of two possibilities, okay? Does it happen to the same treatment? No. You know, it's not the same treatment. It's a great question. It's not the same treatment. This would be in a course. So the first part where you're doing the tonifying might be two or three or four, might be five or six, might be seven or eight treatments until all of a sudden they start to show this excess, until you can push their strength. Depends how run down they are. Some of these patients are incredibly exhausted and it takes a month, month and a half. And while you're tonifying them, they feel a little better, 
And they go, but I'm not great, but I'm a little better. And all of a sudden they go, oh, I think I got sick again. No, this is your chance to get rid of it. So you're waiting to tease out the badger, right? The wild cat and get them out, okay? But that's a great question. It's not in one treatment, okay? Maybe if they're not so bad, maybe the first type of treatment is one or two days. And then they suddenly become acute and then you can get rid of it. The sooner they go to the pseudo acute stage, the healthier they are. Okay. Now, in terms of herbs in the pseudo acute stage, Chuan Xin Lan Kang Yan Luang, right? That first formula, it's one of the ones we use in active COVID. So if you go back to the COVID lecture, you'll see it and have all the ingredients. That's a really powerful formula derived from the one Bing uh, methods from the 16th, 1643. That's a powerful formula to get rid of infectious heat. You use that. Or Shao Chai Hutang. Shao Chai Hutang is from the um, Shanghan uh, epidemic. Okay. So in the Shanghan epidemic, the Shao Chai Hutang is used for the Shaoyang stage. How do you know which one? If their symptoms are very excess and their pulse is big and pounding and their tongue has turned red, then you give them the first one. Shao Chai Hutang Yang Tang. If they don't feel good, but it's like on and off. And they're like, oh, I feel a little better, but I feel worse. I feel a little better. Within the same day, they're going back and forth. The alternating kind of chill fever, their pulse, maybe a little excess, maybe not. Their tongue, if their pulse is excess, their tongue will be a bit pale and deficient. If their tongue is red or coated, then their pulse will often be deficient. They have a mixed presentation, half and half. Then you go shao chai hu tang. And that helps resolve this lingering the Shaoyang stage. Okay, so someone asked a question, how long do you retain the needles? Generally speaking, tonifying needles are gonna be kept. If you're doing a lot of hand technique, not kept that long, but tonifying itself is often kept for a shorter time because you wanna build up but not exhaust them. Dispersive needles kept for a longer time. So generally speaking, if you're doing tonifying, we're past the 25 minute mark. If you just insert with angle and let them be, we're like 26, 27 minutes. But if you're stimulating, cut that down about 15, maybe 20. If you're dispersing and you're working it, maybe 10 minutes. But again, if you're not working it, maybe you're on the 15 to 20 minute, you know, maybe you're, you're dispersive, excuse me, your dispersive is longer, so maybe you're on the 40 minute. If you do no stimulation, you're 40 minutes, you're trying to, you're, it's like airing out a room. If you air out the room and open the windows and just wait for it to disperse, it may take time. If you get some fans, you help it out, it goes faster. Same thing with the dispersive thing. Okay, that's the first step, first step, because there's multiple things that have to go on in stages, not necessarily in one day, in stages, okay? Now, if it's lingering pathogenic factor, now it's a little different, because now we go to lung three, and stomach 12. Stomach 12, why? Well, generally in COVID, we see that this lingers in the, in the lung channel divergency. And the divergent channel of lung breaks off at lung three, runs up under the neck and runs inside up the throat. It can be accessed at lung three and accessed at stomach 12. So you can access the divergency there. You have to disperse. Now, remember the lingering pathogenic state person right is is the pathogen is not that strong you can you don't have to attack it vigorously you have to get those needles in and leach it out so those needles will go in and be retained a long time more than 30 minutes they don't have to be that deep but they have to be in and dispersed don't go deep 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 this is hiding in the divergency you want to get it about half of the depth of the point not too deep halfway through the depth of the point and let the needle sit there and drain it out. Okay. Then lung seven, large intestine four, large intestine six. These are all low points, right? Well, lung seven is a low point, large intestine six is a low point, right? As well as stomach 40, the low point, as well as bladder 58, the low point. Those are drained. You want to drain those. Same as large intestine four. Now, REN three, moot point for the bladder. You want to disperse those, but you use angle of insertion and retain those at least 25 minutes. So the first two retained a little longer, the bottom one's about 25 minutes or so, right? Angle of insertion dispersion. You gotta sneak it out. You gotta coax it out. You gotta get it out of its hideout. Okay, go with herbs. Half dose, half normal dose, 
half based on their body weight, half of shalholodon, which is minor transform, the collaterals decoction. But normal, the double time administration. So normally we go 10 days, 20 days. Why? You've got to coax it out. And this formula drains the law network system and drains the divergencies, it drains things out, right? So, but half dose, you've got to coax this thing away, okay? That's in the lingering pathogen state. Now, the second stage. Uh, doc, doc if, if I may ask, uh, Xiao Huolodan is a very, very warming formula. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the people here in attendance today uh, are from Israel, where the climate is very hot throughout much of the year. Uh, can we use another herb or two to counterbalance the warming no. effects of that formula? No, no, no. Because what we, it's, you're taking half dose. You're below standard therapeutic threshold. Mm -hmm. So you will not produce the same effects as if you take it full dose. Therapeutic threshold is attained by full dose. The reason you take it lower dose, it is warming and it moves to the collaterals and pushes the pathogen out. If you take something that's not the same format, you won't get it out of the divergencies. Right? Mm -hmm. That's why we develop these protocols. And this is not the whole thing. We have to go through the other parts. But this is not... TCM 101. TCM 101 is here's a pattern, here's a formula. That's where we all start. But this is for something you all know COVID's a pain. It changes all the time. We got him figured out. He's like, nope, I'm a variant. We got to figure it out. He's like, nope, I'm another variant. He's really problematical. And he goes after all sorts of things and lodges in here. And so, in that sense, don't be worried. You're going half dose. So someone put in the chat, why stomach 12? Stomach 12 is a crossing point for the lung divergent channel. That's why stomach 12. It's where you can catch the lung divergent channel. Lung divergency, the bien law, breaks off the regular channel and goes elsewhere. Every channel has a divergency. And that's why that's a little strange. And that's something if you were like, I, I didn't see that in my TCM school. That's okay. That's okay. That comes up at the end of TCM school and even often postgraduate training to do the divergencies because they're they're like underground rivers that go off the regular meridian. And unless you study them specifically for weird diseases, they don't use them that much, okay? That's why we use that, okay? All right, so Jonathan, does that make sense in terms of shalholodon? We need that a low dose, push this thing out. Yes, uh, is it safe by the way for them to consume something like green tea at the same time? Not, not while taking the thing, but on the same day. Yeah, green tea would be okay. Green tea's fine. You know, yeah. as, as long as it's, it's, I mean, green tea, at a, I'm drinking it like a tea. Yes. Right? Not green tea like I've stacked it up so much, I'm going to have some mega dose of it, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, just, just to cool off a little bit. I mean, it's, it does ah, get. You're not, you're not, not going to get hot. Don't think, don't, don't, don't obfuscate the treatment. They need to get over this or it will adversely affect their life and may limit the length of time they are on the planet. We all got to go back when the divine calls us. But you know what? He's not mad if you show up early, but he's like, I had more in store for you. You could have done more stuff. So if you drop dead too soon, he's like, oh, well, welcome back. But, you know, let's try to get the people the allotment of the years that they have. So if they're taking 20 days of, of, of Shalholodon, they don't have to take something to pull it. That's, that's not herbalism. Right? Herbalism is that they're being moved and we're pushing them along to make their body heal. And this is a very weird thing. This is not a normal problem in the metabolism. This is an infection that won't end. So, in that sense, we got to address it very specifically. Okay? Uh, yes. Ravital is asking uh, can we uh, use the divergent, sorry, the Hebrew is unclear. Can we use a divergent technique? and uh, do needling on the lung divergent channel i'm not sure if that's what she was asking but that's what came came out of here well the lung divergent channel runs under from lung three under and comes close to stomach 12 and then under it's not easily accessible that's why we use these points but if you have from another training a different technique that can get to the lung divergency or some people do medical qigong, what's called wai qi liao fa, which is external qi emission, where they can move the qi by force of qi. If you are trained in that, 
and you can pull that chi out of the divergent, I guess you could use that, though I've never seen a study on it. But that kind of the medical Qigong literature is not as, one, not as well developed perhaps, but also not as well spread out of China as, as some of the other stuff is. So, but if you have another technique to clear the lung divergency, you could certainly could do that. This is the way we've protocolized it so that it's like, okay, we're working in these steps. Because we develop these steps, we spread them on practitioners, they all treat the same way, we get back and we look at what's going on and we develop protocol. And inevitably, your patient's not a complete protocol. You may need to make a modification of this, but this is like, maybe you have a car and they've put some special, you know, things, how to, you know, special things to, to, to make the car fancy. What's that, 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 that TV show in the United States is called Pimp My Ride. They take the car and make it all fancy. So you have to sometimes enhance the treatment for your patient because that's the person in front of you, right? But this is, you know, um, this is a way to have a foundation to start on something that's worked on a large number of people. Now, someone asked a question, does this work on someone even who had COVID a year ago? If they're still suffering and still in the long haul, then yes, even if it's a year ago, they're long haul, they have the long haul symptoms, they have those things, then yes, this will work. Okay, on we go. Okay, so step two, let's start talking about step two because we gotta keep moving, all right? Okay, all right, so step two, determine the state of the blood. All right, so pale tongue, right? The blood deficiency, if they have pale tongue, thin pulse. Now, this can be showing at the same time, but here, this is how we start to say, how's the state of the blood? More the fatigue, mental fog, pallor, weakness. We have to tonify the blood. Now, we can do this in the same treatment if we had the previous ones, right? Either one, either one, either malarial state or lingering pathogen. But if they're on the blood deficient side, acupuncture blood is 17, 19. Ren four, going vessel four, the tonifying needle, but moxa, remember moxa on top of the needle in odd numbers is tonifying, right? And then I'm gonna mention that uh, February 26, we're gonna do a moxa online class. So you could talk to Jonathan about that if you wanna come and learn some more moxa techniques we'll talk about. But this would be when the moxa is done, the three or you know, three, or, or uh, it has to be an odd number, the three or five rounds of moxa are done, you take the needles out. And herbs though, we wouldn't transition to these herbs until they finish the course of what they were given for either the malarial stage or the lingering pathogen stage. After that, we'd start giving them sultan or substance decoction, right, which is the most foundational form of this tonified blood. So moxa technique is moxa on top of the needle. Someone asked that, moxa on top of the needle, right? Jonto jo, um, uh, jo, the moxa on top of the needle, right? So moxa on top of the needle for that. If, however, they're on the blood stasis side, how is more dusty, SLV is sublingual veins, veins underneath, a choppier pulse or sharp pains, their aches, right, or headaches, Poor sleep is often blood stasis, right? Blood deficiency, you're exhausted. Maybe you're, uh, a little bit trouble falling asleep, but blood stasis, it hurts, you can't move. Principal crack stasis. Now again, same points, right? About a 17, 19, right? But now spleen 10 jumps in there. Gallbladder 34, dispersive technique. And on some of them, if you can, bloodletting, right? All right, bloodletting, okay? So bloodletting, would be on the bladder 17, 19, using the lancet back and forth and put a cup, suck that blood out, right? That would be, we call area bloodletting. That would be most effective. More so on spleen 10, you might use a lancet and then squeeze it or go about a 34, squeeze it, but otherwise dispersive technique, dispersive needling, a lot of manipulation, and then keeps a longer time, potentially up to 40 minutes. But herb wise, again, after they finish their other herbs, they would, why gallbladder 34, someone asked. Gallbladder 34 is the ha point, or ha si ha point for the gallbladder. Gallbladder's major function in TCM is to dredge the blood, which means to break the stasis and clean the blood, and get rid of the blood stasis. That's its major function in TCM. That's why it's used to assist the liver. 
That's why gallbladder 34 helps with blood stasis and chi stasis and it helps break things down. So that's why we use gallbladder 34 here to help to clean or dredge the blood, get rid of the stasis. Good question. All right, now, herbs. Tao Hong Suotong. This is modified for substance decoction with the addition of Tao Ren and Hong Hua. Again, a standard formula. But this one is for blood stasis. Okay? The purpose behind that, crack stasis. When you crack stasis, you still have to make the blood move. That's why it works off the base of the ones that we use for the deficiency. But this would be the blood stasis side. Again, these herbs coming after you've worked with either the malarial state or the lingering pathogenic state. And then this runs about a 10-day course. Might be a little longer if they're if you give a 10-day course and their tongue still looks the same and they're they're with a pale on the deficient side or dusky on the blood stasis, it might go another 10-day course. But over time, once you get to this step, the symptoms start getting better real quick. And it combines with oops, step three, right? We get to step three, which is determining the system that's compromised. This is where we get to the symptomatic part. So the system in question. We well, use standard TCM differential diagnosis, the four inspections. Oh, okay, you know those looking and asking and palpating and smelling. No, smelling. Smelling, interestingly, also means in the Chinese, you smell the qi wei, the qi smell. That means clinical intuition. That means the intuition of what you should do. Okay. Now, many times, Western medical diagnoses will point to the compromised system and can help us. If you have some blood tests, if you have some other things, if the doctor has said, oh, well, I think they have a neurological problem, it can help put you in the right direction. Or people come in and will say, oh, I've been diagnosed with COVID heart. Well, now they already know, they put you in the right direction, right? The doctor said I have COVID liver or COVID kidney. You already know where you're going. All right. The affected system should be treated following standard TCM internal medicine protocols. So I could not in this lecture list all of those because that's a textbook. So I'm hoping all of you have the textbook for that. Um, there is a great textbook that I'll mention if you don't have it, which is Practical Therapeutics of Traditional Chinese Medicine by Yen Wu. That is a great textbook of internal medicine. If you don't have that, get that. That's got a lot of herbs. That's heavy in herbs. Great book. But also there's an exceptional book simply called Clinical Acupuncture. Clinical Acupuncture. And this is by Sir, he was knighted, Sir Anton Jayasuria. I put this also in the chat. Right? That's an amazing book. If you're a heavy, if you're an acupuncturist and you really acupuncture is your main thing, please get that book, Clinical Acupuncture, because Sir Anton Jayasuria was the man who worked back in the, uh, the 70s and 80s with the World Health Organization's Committee on Acupuncture. And he developed the World Health Organization's list of 17 conditions that are seen regularly to develop, to, to, to be amenable to treatment with acupuncture. And he wrote one book. That's the one book. It's an amazing book. And he was an MD, went to China, trained, became an acupuncturist, had a massive clinic in, in uh, uh, Sri Lanka, and treated lots of people, wrote this book. And it's a wonderful book. Um, get that book if you're an acupuncturist. has lots of acupuncture protocols for many, many internal medicine uh, patterns. So the acupuncture in there is very good. Um, the other book, Yen Wu's book, Practical Therapeutics of Traditional Chinese Medicine, is an excellent book, especially for herbs. The acupuncture in there is okay, but not well explained. That's all. It's, it's like, they just kind of listen. They don't tell you why, right? The herbs, they tell why and how to modify. But Dr. Jaya Surya's book, that has acupuncture and why in theory, and it's great. And I know they reprinted, uh, it was available on Amazon for 25 American dollars. So that's a, that's a steal. So, and, but nonetheless. If you, but there may be other textbooks that you guys already have that maybe are in Hebrew, that if you come from Israel or maybe in other languages, depending on where you're listening in from, you know, there are, there, there are many books on internal medicine, but those two, if you don't have one, I would suggest those. Those are good foundational ones. Okay. So, but the affected system is treated that way. Now, this, if it's herbs, you have to wait in the cascade between the malarial or lingering pathogenic factor herbs, then take the step 
to go to the, the blood, deficient or static, and then take the step beyond that to go to the differentially diagnosed ones for this. Okay, so the efficacy and permanence of the third step of this protocol depends on the proper treatment of the first two steps. In other words, if you jump to this, immediately treating the differentially diagnosed internal medicine pattern for their symptoms, and you don't address the malarial dynamic or the lingual pathogenic factor or the blood being deficient or excess, you will not get the clinical results that you expect. It won't work right. So that's something to be very aware of. Okay. So now we get to the last slide and we just, we made it on time because it's just a couple minutes before we're gonna have to end. We'll try to entertain some questions, but unfortunately, time being what it is, I'm committed to other things too. So we're gonna try to work through this and then we'll try to answer some questions. But bottom line here, treatment of COVID-19 sequela relies on proper understanding of the theory of the damage to the blood. That's what I would call the shang shui lun, the damage to blood theory that we're putting forth here from all the clinical experience that we've had, we've put this together. That's what I would advance as a theory, is that the blood is the key to this. It underlies all the long haul issues. If you follow the three part treatment protocol, you get timely remediation, work, works smoothly. If you don't, you just chase the other stuff. It, they seem to linger, it doesn't seem to go away. The new variants of COVID are arising. We know that, okay? How many will keep coming? I don't know. Hopefully not that many, or hopefully the ones that arise will be weaker, I don't know, right? But the clinician, that's you guys, that's us, that's all of us, have to be adaptable to ever more profound sequela that could impact more systems. More systems could be impacted by this. We don't know, right? And people ask me, oh, about the stealth COVID, will that respond to this? I go, well, I don't really know. I think so, because it still is the same virus family, but the question is, we've got to see it in practice. This is also why it's challenging because People broadly have seen the medical community wrestling with something and dealing with it. And the, and the populace, the general populace is not used to the medical community changing its protocols, though it does. Whether we're talking about TCM, we're talking about Western medicine, we're talking about chiropractic, we're talking about naturopathic, we're talking about whatever, they all evolve as disease evolves. So people have seen that and they've been shocked by it. Okay, but we have to adapt because this is adapting. Okay. The potential for long-term hidden pathogenic influence from COVID-19 cannot be underestimated. And here's the thing. Hopefully, by the power of divine, we get past all this stuff. Fine. But it don't mean it's all gone. It doesn't mean it's all gone. Because some poor sap out there, some poor guy, is going to be suffering for two or three years, thinking, I don't know what's wrong with me, because he had an asymptomatic case. He's going to go for neural testing and EMG and all this stuff. You, hopefully, are going to be the person five years from now who says, and you might have had COVID and go back to this protocol and hopefully resolve that suffering, ease the human suffering for that guy who's going to be out there, who's going to be looking for you. Okay, that's hopefully where we get to. Okay. So, Doc, a very important point raised by uh, our friends at Trifolium. They said that the different aconites, whether foods or the ones found in uh, Siopolodan, are forbidden in Israel. And now, of course, private imports are a thing, but nonetheless, the pharmacies cannot provide them. Uh, what could the pharmacies do in order to accommodate for maybe other herbs in that formula or exchange it for something else, perhaps? Well, that's a good question. That's a really good question. And that's a question that I will, I would be more than willing to spend the weekend looking at a couple of sources to look at standard Chinese and Korean and Japanese sources and say, what do they substitute for FUTSA? And then send, send them an email with that because I don't want to shoot from the hip, meaning I don't want to just answer and you know not give the best answer because that answer could influence formulas that then influence hundreds and hundreds of people. So I, I, that's, that's, the best answer is I got to not give the answer right now because you know what they say about research, research is search, and search again, that's why we call it research, right? So I wanna make sure that, that you know, I give the best answer. So I'm, I'm hoping that, maybe it's a disappointing answer, but it's the best one I can give you because again, where that could influence hundreds or thousands of people, you know, we gotta, I gotta be clear on that. I gotta look very carefully and say, what's the best solution? And maybe email back and forth with them and say, this is the best solution. They go, we can't get that either. Ooh. Cause there may be things that just are not available or things that would be pricey to import for some reason. 
Like for us in the U.S., seahorse, incredibly expensive. It is endangered, but seahorse is really expensive now. Meanwhile, depending on where you are in the world, seahorse is not. And so that that's something. So, so Jonathan, that's maybe the best answer I can give that team of you know herbal experts is that you know. So the, hopefully they can hopefully they can wait wait till wait till Sunday night when I try to figure that out. Let the puzzler let the wheels in the head turn a little bit and look at some sources. All right. Certainly. And, and I was asked for the, the PDF and, and, and more information that people would like to know about your future classes. Uh, folks, um, if you're not already on our listing on WhatsApp, then please send me a message. I'll drop my phone number in the chat and uh, you're more than welcome to send me a message and I'll keep you posted with everything. So also I'm going to send once we're done, I'm going to fix that one typo that, that, that uh, you're not found from me. Thank you. Because and I'm going to send these slides to Jonathan and he'll send them to all of you. Okay. Um, also, uh, we've uh, recorded this. I'm going to once the recording compiles, I'm going to send it to Jonathan. He's going to post it up. And, you know, I'm hoping that this was helpful for everybody. I'm hoping that it took you a bit further forward in your understanding how to treat this. Um, and this is a, you know, collaborative event you know what i mean it's it's you know we're colleagues fighting in the same fight so in that regard you figure something out you figure out wait a minute you do this wait a minute you do that this acupuncture point this work then give it to me i'll send it to our research group we'll send it everywhere we'll get it all over the place because you know that's that's how we're we collectively you know humanity whatever country we're in it doesn't really matter you know that's the nature of being a doctor Right, doctors. The, the the nature of being a doctor transcends these barriers. So, hopefully, this was helpful to everybody. We'll spread all this stuff. If you got other friends who couldn't make it, let them see it. You know, and hopefully that'll help somebody. If it helps even somebody one, you know, one place in the corner of the planet, then you know, hopefully we did good today. All right. All right. So, um, time being uh, what it is. And unfortunately, we're gonna have yeah, to pretty much well, sign we off. Have, but, we have another minute or two, perhaps, if someone wants to ask one final question. Well, we got like yeah, we got like one minute before I gotta disappear and put, and put on a different hat. Okay, so and uh, also if someone would like to uh, find the, the doctor's lecture again, look on the chat. I sent you my, um, my my Israeli phone number. Send me a message, and I'll send you a link to the the professor's uh, previous lecture on the treatment of the acute COVID condition. All right, which is very important. Okay. Any questions? Any final questions? That either means you had a good time or you're like, man, I got to think about this. One or the other. Uh, so someone, Ilana is asking, uh, can you please say something about anosmia? Insomnia. In I, yeah, I guess she means insomnia. Sure, insomnia. So insomnia, if you have insomnia post COVID, again, it's from the, it really roots very heavily out of the blood. Oh, so, no, no, no. She, she means uh, smell loss. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Yes. So, okay. So generally the loss of taste and smell is blood stasis. So if they are right out of COVID with that, give them Yunnan Bayao and Yunnan Bayao often return, restores the sense of smell within two days or so. I had one young lady, this poor girl, she was maybe in, in, in uh, I don't know the kilograms very well, but she was 115 pounds, pretty thin, 115 pounds. Um, she got COVID afterwards, everything smelled like garbage. Everything smelled like garbage. And so everything smelling like garbage, she couldn't eat. She went down to 85 pounds. That's an adult, 85 pounds. That's not an adult body weight. She was weak, couldn't stand anything. Everything smelled like garbage, couldn't, didn't want to eat, was getting a little mental about all this. Well, she was about two, maybe, maybe about, about, that's probably about five weeks outside of COVID. Although it was late, it gave her Yunnan Bayao, which is again for scarring and trauma, but it's for blood stasis. It went right to that because some of the ingredients in that formula open the orifices. And this was blood stasis blocking the orifices. So it gave her that to start with. If a blood stasis went right there, okay, jumped over everything else. Why? Because it was so acute. Gave her that. Her sense of smell started to come back within two days. She could eat. Okay. Stabilize that. And then going back through this, she was in the malarial state. So we had to give her tonics to strengthen her because she was so exhausted, she was showing no symptoms. As we got her stronger, 
and we gave, did acupuncture to make her stronger and gave her herbs to make her stronger. Then she almost got acute. She said, I think I have COVID again. That was the stage where we could disperse it and then go to resolving blood stasis because she had other blood static signs. And then and th that resolved that case. But if it's the smell and it's really, that's the issue, just the issue, Yunnan Biao is probably the best thing to go right away as it, it gets a change, usually within two, maybe three days. I've seen that again and again. Then you still have to go through the differentiation. But if they can't eat, they can't get stronger. Right? So, so that hopefully that answers that question. Okay. Listen up, this is very important. In Israel, uh, it's illegal to have Yunnan Biao. Doesn't mean <laughs> people don't have it, but it's illegal. So if you can't get it, you can still uh, do, do sometimes with Sun Chi, the herb Sun Chi, which is the main ingredient in Yunnan Biao. But the thing is, okay, so. Jonathan, you should have, you have the formula for Yunnan Biao, don't you? I have it at home, yes. Okay, you have the formula, the list of the formula. So we can send the formula to everybody who's in the, who posted up, but also the question would be, and I don't know the answer to this, the Trifolium team would know this, what in there is illegal? So if they could pull uh, that I'm out. Not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure, but I know that Trifolium are attempting to de develop their own Yunnan Biao to try and right. make it in Israel. That, that, that's maybe... A few weeks or a few months down the road. Right. Because Yunnan Biao is the name of an area. Yunnan is Yunnan province in China. So it would no longer be Yunnan Biao. It would be Israel Biao if yeah. you're in Israel. <laughs> because that's the name of a province. So, but it, the formula may be, maybe you can assemble the formula there. Or maybe we'd have to take out an ingredient or make a substitution. All right, but I'll leave that to the experts, the herb team, who was kind enough to, you know, spread the word on the lecture and everything, and, and, and you know, let the let the pharmacists and scientists resolve that problem. Right, we the clinicians have to say what can we use in the field. All right, but if you could mimic the formula, so Jonathan, please put that formula up with this, you know, listed, um, uh, so that people can see it, and then they can say, okay, what can I get out of that? And if you have to make one substitution, maybe make one change, but it's very well balanced to get rid of blood stasis and open the orifices and help the periphery. So it's a powerful formula. Yeah, and also, if, if you have a minute, someone's asking about uh, an uh, acute case of arthritis The doctors say has erupted as a result of COVID. Is that possible? Yes, because COVID itself, because one, it damages the blood, two, it hyperstimulates your immune system, can wind, make you go into an arthritic state. And you're, you're, it can be either an arthritic state where it's autoimmune driven or arthritic state where it's based on circulation. Most times we look at that as being malarial, type problem and then going into it being blood stagnant and then so treat for the malarial type format and blood stagnant and then go and work with things that resolve b syndrome things like dren b tom or Tom would be where we come to after that so but that is we do see that we see arthritic dynamics come up um you know arthralgia which is and inflammation, you know, pain in the joint, and arthritis, inflammation in the joint, those are often very common with uh, post-COVID, um, especially if they have a tendency for it before, if they have a mild arthritis before. All right, I got the unit layout here for people to see. So the box usually looks like this. Uh, it comes with a bunch of pills. There's 16 pills per box. And in the middle, there is a red pill. The red pill is for very severe bleeding. It's not for everyday patients, it's for severe trauma. Uh, and I think, uh, Doc, the, in terms of pills, what they take um, two, two pills? pills four time, two pills four times a day at 140 pounds. Yeah, two two pills, pills four, four times a day if you are 140 pounds or 63 kilos. So please take note that uh, if you need to use it at a full dose for, for a 140 pound person that's 63 kilos, this box is only going to last for two days so be aware of that and it could be a it's not very expensive right but if you need several boxes it might get expensive and my suggestion is also do not throw the box after you're done with those pills because there's the red pill in the middle which is very useful for emergencies keep the box with the red pill agreed agreed so usually we say five boxes 10 days five boxes 10 days for that okay for the 140 pound person yeah, someone asked, can it be ordered on Amazon? I don't think so, but you can get it on eBay. You can definitely get it on eBay. Active Herb also has it. 
I, I don't think it active herb if they if they ship to Israel it might get stuck in customs. But I have no idea. If someone wants to ask me, I, I have an eBay seller that, that sells their products. Like it's a dollar or more and it wouldn't get stuck in customs. So just ask me about that. All right. So Jonathan, unfortunately, time and time being what it is, I've got to go to other commitments. So but I want to thank everybody for coming, right? Thank you all for coming, right? Hope you had a good time, thank right? You. And then thank you. Thank you very you. much. Hope to see you in other classes and stuff like that, okay? And fight the good fight. Keep trying to help all those people, all right? Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.